Welcome to Carol and Gary's Sea America Tour. Hello again, everyone. After an hour and a half drive south, Carol, Jasper, and I are now in Dearborn, Michigan. Dearborn, Michigan is the home of the Henry Ford Automotive Facility. The Henry Ford Complex has several areas that are worth a visit. But the area is so big that it's impossible to see everything in one day. So on Friday, September 20th, Carol and I visited the Henry Ford Museum. The Henry Ford Museum wasn't just a collection of Ford automobiles. It was more about innovations that have changed our society. This is the 1906 Thomas Flyer Touring Car, a powerful toy for the wealthy. It cost $3,500 in 1906. This doesn't seem like much by today's standards, but in 1906 the average wage was $523 per year. If you had no other expenses, it would have taken you six years and nine months for a worker to make enough money to pay for this automobile. But in 1906, no one needed an automobile. Trains, trolleys, bicycles, and horse-drawn carriages served well for transportation. Car owners could do things that they didn't need to do, but soon discovered that they enjoyed them. Like traveling at high speed on their own schedule. Racing. Controlling something powerful and dangerous. Owning something valuable and modern. Although at first only wealthy people could afford cars, they weren't the only ones who wanted them. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Henry Ford did not invent the automobile, but he was an innovator. As a boy, he took apart toys, clocks, and watches to see how they worked. In 1891, at the age of 27, Henry left a secure future on his father's farm to take a job at Edison Illuminating Company of Detroit. He knew little about electricity, but was a quick learner. His work impressed his superiors, and by early 1894 was promoted to chief engineer. While working at the Edison Illuminating Company, Ford built his first horseless carriage, the Quadricycle. But he was just one of many men experimenting with horseless carriages at the time. Henry Ford's first automotive venture, called Detroit Automotive Company, lasted less than a year before failing. He left his second business, Henry Ford Company, in a dispute with his financial backers after just three months. In 1903, at the age of 39, Henry tried again, calling his new business Ford Motor Company. His first car built in 1903 as Ford Motor Company was the Model A runabout. It was the typical horseless carriage. The engine was under the seat and drove the rear wheels with an oversized bicycle chain. In 1908, Ford Motor Company introduced the Model T. The Model T isn't simply the most important Ford. It may be the most important car ever. Ford's vision was to get the price down so that he could sell his cars to the middle class families. The Model T is the first car that became affordable to the masses. It was introduced in 1908 at a price of $850. In 1910, Ford Motor Company moved production of its Model T into an innovative new factory in nearby Highland Park. Late in 1913, Ford Motor Company began experimenting with assembling whole cars on a moving assembly line. Henry Ford recognized that true mass production involved synchronizing workers, materials and machinery so that parts flowed smoothly throughout the factory. By 1914 the assembly line was standard procedure. Moving assembly lines soon revolutionized manufacturing around the world. By the 1920s mass production had increased output while reducing the cost of manufacturing. Ford was able to reduce the starting price of a Model T to $260. But with success came problems. In 1914, as a result of the workers at the Ford Motor Plant complaining about the work being boring and relentless and worker turnover high, Henry Ford announced the $5 day, up from $2.34 per day. It was revolutionary, about twice what factory workers were used to being paid. However, not everyone qualified and a portion of the $5 was paid as an hourly wage. The rest was profit sharing. Still, this gave workers more money to spend and encouraged them to stay on the job in spite of repetitious, exhausting work. The Ford Model T was built until 1927, selling more than 15 million cars over a 19-year span. Henry's son Edsel replaced Henry as head of the company in 1919, but Henry still kept his hand in the management, including adamantly opposing changes to the design of the Model T. Four-wheel brakes, for example, were invented in 1909, but Henry resisted incorporating them into the Model T. 
He was accused of neglecting customer demand for improvements, which led to Ford steadily losing market share to General Motors and Chrysler. Finally, in 1928, the Ford Model A, which incorporated all of the latest technological advances that had happened during the time that the Model T was sold. Yes, this was the second time that the Model A was produced by Ford, but back then there was no standards for naming automobiles. The Model A was the first Ford to use a standard set of driver controls with conventional clutch and brake pedals, throttle and gear shift. The fuel tank was situated between the engine compartment and the dash panel and had a visual fuel gauge. The Model A was the first car to have safety glass in the windshield. But enough about Henry Ford. The museum also had a collection of vehicles used by former presidents of the United States. This is the carriage used by Theodore Roosevelt for parades and other outings. It also had limited use by William Taft, Woodrow Wilson, and Warren Harding. This vehicle was used by Franklin Roosevelt and Harry Truman. It had extra wide running boards for the Secret Service to stand on. This vehicle was used by Harry Truman, Dwight Eisenhower, and John F. Kennedy until his 1961 Lincoln arrived. None of these cars were bulletproof. This is the 1961 Lincoln that John F. Kennedy was riding in when he was shot in Dallas. It too was not bulletproofed at the time of the assassination, but would be after he was shot. This car was used by Richard Nixon, Gerald Ford, Jimmy Carter, Ronald Reagan, and George H. Bush. It is fully armor-plated and has bulletproof glass. The rear bumper folds down for the Secret Service to stand on, and the handrail rises out of the trunk for them to hang on. In 1919, a road improvement project in Henry Ford's hometown meant his birthplace would need to be moved 200 yards from its original location or destroyed. He decided to move the house and restore it to the way that it looked at the time of his mother's death in 1876 when he was 13 years old. Ford personally took charge of the birthplace restoration, meticulously recreating the details of the house down to the original or similar furnishings. He dedicated the restoration of his childhood home to his mother's memory and her teachings. His mother had encouraged his early tinkering and youthful inventions, and he felt sure that she had set him on this unique path in life. When the restoration of this childhood home was complete, people were awestruck by its authenticity. It seemed remarkable to Ford and others how a recreated environment could catapult one into another time and place. This was the beginning of Ford's interest in preservation of historic buildings, and after several other restorations of buildings on their original site, he began looking to create a village that would represent the early days of America up to the present. Working with a Ford Motor Company draftsman and architect, Henry Ford began laying out plans for Greenfield Village. Greenfield Village wasn't meant to represent any specific place in the United States or even serve as a particular town. He created Greenfield Village primarily from buildings that he had purchased and moved to the site. Organizing them around a village green with a courthouse, a town hall, church, store, an inn, and a school. So when Carol and I arrived at Greenfield Village, the first thing we did was take a 30 minute ride around the perimeter on a train pulled by a 1932 steam engine. We soon realized that we couldn't see much on a train encircling the perimeter, but decided to enjoy the ride until we returned to the starting point. When we started walking around, we noticed several people riding around in old vehicles. So we took a ride too.
So as I said, this bus is from 1931. Everything about it is the way it was in 1931. The engine, the transmission, the brakes, everything about it is from 19, except for me, from 1931. Now, the only thing we have done for this thing is, well, we've restored it. So the original engine, it's been rebuilt who knows how many times. Transmission, everything about it. Our ride in the Model T lasted for approximately 15 minutes while our driver gave us many interesting facts about the Model T. After our ride, we walked around looking at old buildings. Thomas Edison, who was a former boss and close personal friend of Henry Ford, had a small complex where he worked on his experiments and inventions. Henry Ford later bought Edison's complex and had it moved to Greenfield Village so the guests could see some of Edison's work. This is some of the equipment used in his complex. In 1896, Edison set a goal to have one major invention every six months and a minor invention every ten days. He was very close to achieving this goal. Workers at the village were using Ford trucks to haul tables and chairs from storage to an outdoor patio for an event later that day. This is known as the Ferris Windmill, one of Henry Ford's historical restoration projects. Built on Cape Cod in the mid-1600s, it is believed to be the oldest surviving windmill in the United States. This house belonged to Noah Webster and his wife Rebecca in New Haven, Connecticut, where Noah worked on writing his famous American Dictionary in 1828. We had an enjoyable second day at the Henry Ford Complex. Like the museum that we visited yesterday, Greenfield Village is worth a visit. On Wednesday, September 25th, Carol and I visited the Ford Rogue Plant Assembly Building where Ford F-150 trucks are assembled, but unfortunately no pictures were allowed inside the plant. As advertised, the Rogue plant is a marvel of timing and coordination. In the final assembly building that we toured, parts are transported to the specific areas in large bins, much like you would see luggage being moved around at an airport. When a bin full of parts was dropped off, the empty bin was picked up and removed immediately. Truck chassis were moved down the assembly line on a platform about the size of a 4x8 sheet of plywood. Workers performed their specific tasks as the truck passed by. There is a separate assembly line for the doors, so the doors are completely assembled when delivered to the area where they will be attached to the truck. Parts are coated so that when a worker adds a part, it is accounted for. Workers are timed on everything they do. If a worker is working at the correct speed and has completed every task as the vehicle passed by, a green light blinked, showing that all steps were completed correctly and on time. If a worker is working too slowly, an amber light blinks. Or if a worker does not complete every step, a red light blinked, alerting management. Workers assigned to each area belong to a team of 10 people. Two of these people fill in during breaks or take over if someone gets sick. We walked around the perimeter of the assembly plant watching the assembly process below us from an elevated walkway that was approximately one-third of a mile long. Assembled parts such as doors traveled above our heads as they made their way to the area where they would be joined with the correct vehicle. Carol noticed that the colors of the individual vehicles passing down the line varied. This would make it challenging for the people sending finished doors to match up at the time of mounting. Although we could take as long as we wanted, the average time to complete the tour is 30 to 45 minutes. The Ford Rogue plant completes the assembly of a new F-150 truck every minute. Our Ford Motor Assembly plant tour was extremely interesting. It would be hard to imagine all of the simultaneous activity without seeing it for yourself. And with that we are done touring the Ford Motor Complex in Dearborn, Michigan. Although it's been a lot of walking, every one of the three tours was very enjoyable. We will be leaving Michigan on Sunday and driving south for our appointment to have our slider repaired in Elkhart, Indiana on Monday. Michigan is the 28th state that Carol and I have visited together. If you like this video but have not yet subscribed, please do so to be notified of future videos and as always feel free to share with your friends. Thanks for watching.